presents a Talk of the Times event on the issue of intelligent design versus evolution in Seattle on April 26th. I'm awfully glad you're here to join us for tonight's conversation. Uh, there are still, if you're looking for seats, there are a few stray singles scattered throughout the center section, and then there are two and three seats available together on the extreme sides. But believe it or not, the sight line is quite good, and the acoustics are very good on the sides, so don't hesitate to sit on the sides. <coughs> I'd like to welcome everybody to this, the first of uh, 2006's uh, Talk of the Times, uh, which is a series we do with uh, the Seattle Times. We're glad to sponsor tonight's event with them. I want to call your attention to a few uh, upcoming events at Town Hall before I get to introductions of the, of the speakers. Tomorrow night, we'll bring Seattle Follies, our popular political cabaret built on a solid foundation of ill-advised satire, ill-considered opinion, and beer price to move. Guests include Norm Stamper, Dave Minert, Reggie Watts, and some eccentric and inspiring Fisher poets we dug up for you in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, that'll be downstairs at 7.30 tomorrow night. Uh, the next talk of the Times is scheduled for May 19th, and uh, it's appreciably more serious than Seattle Follies tomorrow night. It's a one-on-one -on -one with Simon Shama, the acclaimed historian and art historian, author of Citizen, Rembrandt's Eyes, Landscape and Memory, the landmark TV series A History of Britain, and the recent Rough Crossings. He'll be joined by Seattle Times book editor Marianne Gwynn. It came together a bit too late to be included in our calendar, um, so make a mental note. That's on May 19th, Friday evening, 7.30 p.m. downstairs. I urge you to pick up Town Hall's calendar, actually, on your way out, because you'll learn more about our jam-packed May. I love to say I designed it this way, but we sort of stumbled into a focus on women's political engagement with appearances by NARAL President uh, Kate Michaelman, MoveOn.org co-founder Joan Blades and local activist Kristen Rao Finkbeiner, pollster Celinda Lake, and anti-war activist Cindy Sheehan, Nobel Prize winner Sheeran Abadi, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Like I said, it's a packed month for us, and I hope you'll be back a few times. Finally, a quick word about tonight's format. We've already begun distributing, or we're about to begin distributing question cards. Uh, you'll want to write down your name and any question you might have, and we'll be back to pick them up from you in about 30 minutes. We'll use these questions to conclude the evening after a moderated conversation. Know that we may not be able to get to every question, so write your name, write your question, and we'll do our best to get to it. As anyone who's followed the subject of tonight's conversation will tell you, even the semantic frame of the issue proves debatable, and hotly so. So I'll tiptoe into it by saying that the Seattle Times and Town Hall are pleased to welcome to the stage two of our region's most articulate voices in the recent and contentious conversation about the nature of the origin and development of life. And that there's a reason tonight's conversation between two scientists also sits comfortably within the purview of the paper's chief political reporter. Stephen C. Meyer is the director and senior fellow of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle. He earned his PhD in the history and philosophy of science from Cambridge University for a dissertation entitled Of Clues and Causes, a Methodological Interpretation of Origin of Life Studies. Previously, he worked as a geophysicist with the Atlantic Richfield Company after earning his undergraduate degrees in physics and geology at Whitworth College. Meyer has co-authored two books, Darwinism, Design, and Public Education, and Science and Evidence of Design in the Universe. He is joined on our stage by Dr. Peter Ward, a paleontologist and University of Washington professor of geology, biology, zoology, and astrobiology. His work specializes in the Cretaceous tertiary extinction and mass extinctions generally. He is the author or co-author of 12 books, many on biodiversity and the fossil record. Titles include Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe, Gorgon, Obsession, Paleontology, and the Greatest Mass Extinction, and his latest, Life as We Do Not Know It, the NASA search for and synthesis of alien life. Here to lead tonight's conversation is the Seattle Times' esteemed political reporter, David Postman. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Meyer, Peter Ward, and David Postman. Wow. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the uh, audience estimates grew quickly the last uh, couple of days. Pre appreciate you all coming out. A um, couple of quick uh, words on format, which is there really isn't going to be much of a format. It's not a debate. We're not going to be timing people. There's no bells or buzzers or hooks or anything of that sort. Uh, we hope to have a conversation. Um, the uh, uh, understanding is the, the, the guests will jump in when they feel they want to. Uh, we will be polite, um, but they'll always listen to me when I tell them to stop. Um, 
Uh, as you heard, question cards are coming around, uh, so um, try to be concise. We will be uh, filtering those out a little bit uh, and starting to ask them, you know, about 40 minutes into the, the program. Um, I don't know that we'll get to all the questions. Um, we, I think we're asking you to put your names on there in case we want to try to get a follow-up from somebody. So, uh, again, we're looking for a little bit of dialogue and, and uh, looking for open minds at least uh, for, for 90 minutes so we can have the discussion. Um, obviously, it's a contentious issue. Um, I learned about it firsthand, uh, how contentious it is, this morning when a story that I wrote appeared in the Seattle Times and my email started to fill up before uh, dawn. As people around the country were reading the article, somebody obviously had posted it somewhere, and I heard from uh, esteemed uh, uh, academics from around the country, and I must say most of them, um, well, all of them unhappy with me, and um, all of them uh, uh, opponents of intelligent design, um, pretty clearly convinced that I was, in the Seattle Times, was in the business of promoting intelligent design. And, and I was a little taken back by that. And it wasn't until later in the day or in the morning that a colleague emailed me and said, have you looked at the Discovery Institute blog? Uh, they're on to you. So I, I looked there, and there's some criticism coming from that side. And, and there are reporters that will tell you, oh, if I've made both sides mad, you know, I've done something right. Um, I don't usually uh, agree with that, but I will today. Um, it's the comfort I shall take. Um, and I think it allows us to start with a little bit of middle ground uh, in this tough, tough issue, uh, which I think both sides that are represented uh, here tonight can agree that I'm not smart enough to handle the issue. So we start with that, and uh, I won't be offended by that. Uh, I also learned just now, though, that, that both uh, intelligent design and Darwinian evolution allows for water skiing because both of our guests are accomplished water skiers. So, you know, we're not all so different. Um, we uh, uh, talked a little bit before we came out here about how to start, so there's no big surprise here on my questions. Um, and um, again, we're not trying to um, pull any fast ones or get anybody on the hot seat and uh, try to get the conversation going. And one of the things I found in trying to write about this issue is it's very difficult to summarize intelligent design. Um, partly because it's complicated, partly because it's controversial, and newspapers don't have a lot of room. We don't, we get a paragraph or two to say this is what it is, not books to say what it is. So that's a difficult thing, and I must say the uh, advocates, the promoters of intelligent design don't usually agree with how it comes out in the newspaper. So I wanted to start, see, with giving you the opportunity to tell me and all of us, if you were charged with that, if you had a paragraph or two to explain intelligent design to newspaper readers, not to scientific readers or anybody else, how would you do it? Uh, David, thank you. And uh, thanks to Peter for joining us and for all of you for coming. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll give you our straight up definition and then maybe uh, there's time I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why we might have objected a bit as to the way you portrayed us. Sure. But I, uh, I do appreciate the, the question so directly. Um, the theory of intelligent design holds that there are certain features of the universe and of living systems that are best explained by an intelligent cause rather than an undirected natural process. And so what do we mean by that? And that's, 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 that's our, our so short synopsis. we got synopsis. one paragraph. Okay. Now, what, what was the right. second one? That was only a sentence. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 